thanks for inviting me. And um, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Well, um, where does uh, religion come from? You see, there are some um, modern um, theologians in the Christian world who say, well, uh, man needs God, God needs men, and so they find each other, they set up a bridge between them. Uh, that's, that's a very modern idea. Um, anciently, the more usual idea is that unilaterally, it is God who opens the conversation with men. And so God addresses men, speaks to him reveals himself through uh, wondrous signs or more usually through a privileged telephone line of prophet. I um, will not say that in Hinduism this idea is non-existent. I mean, it, pretty much everything that you have anywhere in the world, you also have in Hinduism. So this idea of revelation is there. And indeed, I, I would say that it's a weakness of the human mind, something tamasic, something inertial, that people make it easy for themselves by assuming, oh, there is a higher source uh, of, 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 of truth. And so from there, some eternal truths are being revealed, and we just have to... Um, hang low and accept what comes from above. You see, this idea is not non-existent in Hinduism. Like, um, I have to regularly cross swords with uh, traditionalists in Hinduism who say that the Vedas are revealed, that God or whoever, um, something supernatural, is the source of the Vedas and so that they came from above and that the seers, the rishis have not composed the Vedas, but instead have seen them. They were revealed to them. You see, in the case of the Vedas, I definitely think this is not true. If you respect the Vedas and the least you can do is consult the Vedas themselves, what do they say about it? And so they are very explicit. <laughs> it's the rishis who composed the Vedic hymns, no one else. And you can see that in the form they take, it is a man who addresses God, uh, or one of the gods at least. Uh, like in the Battle of the Ten Kings, it is Vasishta, the seer Vasishta, who addresses Indra. And um, so this is always very explicit in the Vedic hymns. It is said very explicitly, me, the man, I address you, God. I ask you to do this, or I tell you you are great because of this. But at any rate, it's always man who addresses the God. It is like a, um, a young lover who goes to the balcony of his sweetheart and he sings a serenade for her. You see, that's the role of the rishis vis-a-vis -vis the deity. And in the prophetic religions, it is exactly the reverse. There, it is not just an, in an inertial tendency of human beings to assume some divine source. No, it is a very official teaching. The religion stands or falls with this revelation. So where did this start? Well, uh, this may be very old. You see, uh, human beings are 100,000 years old or more. And as far as we know, some kind of religion has been there all the time. And uh, so people assume that things came from above. Uh, this is a matter of... Um, uh, the the instinct for survival at work. You see, when you walk through through the forest or the savanna, 
and suddenly in the bushes you hear some rustling, some sound. Well, either you think, oh, it's nothing, you keep walking, and the next minute a tiger jumps upon you and eats you. Or you may be suspicious and think, oh my God, there's a pattern there, maybe it's a tiger. And then you are on the alert. Even that may not save you, but in many cases it will save you. And so after some generations, only the human beings who recognized patterns survived. And so religion is a kind of pattern recognition. It's like seeing faces in the clouds. You see, where there is a random thing, you assume that there is something meaningful. Now, we don't know about the prehistory. We only start to know the moment that people leave testimony. So when writing was invented some 5,000 years ago. And um, there then we have, um, we have the early Bible. Well, the form of the Bible, but that's only a human artifact. Uh, it starts with God speaking. You see, God creates the world by speaking. He says, let there be light. And there was light. Um, but you see, that's, that's, that's a theology. That's once they have already a precise picture of God, of what God does, of how he operates, how he creates the world. But the first testimony of a human being receiving messages from God, well, that too is early in the Bible, namely in the story of Adam and Eve. They talk with God in the Garden of Eden, and God addresses them. God gives them commandments. Then later, God muses to himself, oh my God, you see, I shouldn't have made mankind. And then he decides to punish them, but he makes an exception. To Noah, he says, oh, watch out. You see, there is a flood coming. You save yourself. So it's God speaking to man, man listening and successfully. Because all the people who didn't hear God, they drowned. Whereas Noah, he listened to God and he was saved. Um, then you get the character of Abraham. Now here, Abraham behaves quite strangely. You see, you read his whole life. You know, there are many episodes that people don't know. Like, for instance, he uh, flees to Egypt at the time of famine or something in the Middle East. He goes to Egypt, which was always the granary, which is always a rich, opulent country. And um, there he lends out his wife to the pharaoh. Now, you see, you can, of course, speculate what this psychologically might mean and so on, but at any rate, it's a strange behavior. And it's not that people back then were so very different. No, because the story itself says that the pharaoh is startled when he finds out. So back then, too, this behavior was deemed strange. And so Abraham is a strange fellow. And so when his uh, main act of prophecy occurs, we should keep in mind, you see, maybe there is something fishy. Namely, what happens, for a long time he's been aspiring to have a son. And with his wife it doesn't work. Then, you see, as it you know, was fairly usual in those days, he does it with a maidservant, Hagar the Egyptian, and she gets pregnant, so he has already one son, Ismail. Uh, and then he keeps trying with his wife, and finally um, he is rewarded, and so a, a son of his own is coming. Although a son of his own, here again we have his strange behavior, it is described that some angels of the Lord paid him a visit. But the description of these angels is just about regular human beings. 
You see, they come in, um, uh, they wash their feet, um, they get flour cakes baked by Sarah, the wife of uh, Abraham. And then they go into the tent with Abraham's wife and they tell Abraham, um, just be assured, you see, in a few months time, you'll have a son. So it's a very strange behavior. You see, there are these men um, later described as angels who come to visit his wife and then she gets pregnant. Whereas all these years with Abraham, it didn't work. Well, again, you see, it's strange. It's a strange story. Um, but so, okay, we'll, we'll take the word of the, the biblical author for it and assume that Abraham fathered the child, uh, Isaac. And then uh, he hears the voice of God. This is prophecy at work. The voice of God is whispering into his ear and God orders him, that son that you've been trying for for so many years, now I want you to sacrifice that son to me. Again, the details of the biblical story show that his surroundings, especially his wife, think there's something fishy. They keep an eye on him when he takes the son out uh, in the countryside where he's going to sacrifice him. Of course, this, uh, this story should be seen against the cultural background. Namely, the um, Bible throughout is very up in arms against a pagan cult existing among the Israelites and among hardly anyone else. You see, throughout the world, there were all kinds of strange cultic practices, including human sacrifice. But this particular form of human sacrifice was very special. You see, peoples who brought human sacrifice, like the Aztecs famously, but also my ancestors, probably your ancestors, long, long, long ago, um, they, they gave sources of blood to the gods but they didn't care much whom. So they took prisoners or they took their own local criminals, you know, seized them and then uh, took them to the altar and slit their throat or somehow killed them. Now, the Israelites were made of sterner stuff. You see, they, they thought, well, you shouldn't, take your, your dustbin to the altar and give, give something that you yourself don't want to go. You see, if you want to bring a human sacrifice, you don't give your criminals or your captured enemies or so. No, you give the best that you have. You see, God is not just anyone. To God, you give the best you have. Now, what in the world do you love most? You see, all people, um, they love their children most and especially their firstborn. So you have an ancient practice where the Canaanites, the, the citizens of the Holy Land, sacrifice their firstborn. And so this is what Abraham is doing now. For an Israelite audience, the reference was very clear. This referred to the ancient practice of sacrificing the firstborn. That's what Abraham's going to do. And then another voice appears, again, probably some voice of God, and says, you know, stop. God stays his hand. He's not going to sacrifice his son. So he makes an end to the ancient practice of sacrificing the firstborn. And he sacrifices the sheep instead. So here we have a very clear version of God speaking to man. That is prophetism. 
And so in, uh, in the Bible, this is not usually uh, articulated like this. They don't call Abraham a prophet. In the Quran, of course, Abraham is the prophet par excellence. Uh, while Adam hears the voice of God, Noah hears the voice of God, then Abraham, then Moses, then several others, and then Jesus. You know, for Christians, Jesus is not a prophet. For Muslims, Jesus is a prophet. He heard the voice of God. He spoke uh, the word of God. Anyway, so the, the, the first elaborate example is Abraham. Now, um, the real institution of prophecy, though, starts with the next big name, namely Moses. Um, first of all, it is Moses who starts the um, tradition of monotheism. In Abraham's life, God is taken for granted. There is reference to God. God says this. God forbids that. Um, but God does not insist on being the only one. You see, God is one among many still. Now that changes with Moses. And it's again prophecy that does it. Namely, uh, at one point in his life, he is a fugitive. He grows up in the court of Egypt to the pharaoh. You know, he's, a, he's an elite person. Um, and then he commits murder. And people find out and he has to become a fugitive. He runs away from Egypt and he goes to live among the Bedouins in Arabia. And so that's a very different culture, even in a very practical sense. In Egypt, it is sunny all the time, 365 days a year. Among the Bedouins, they are used to snow, uh, to, to sandstorms. And so their pantheon is different, their deities are different. And so they know of a storm goal somewhat similar to Indra in India. And um, so Moses hears about the storm god and that becomes a part of his life. Both Indra and Rudra are storm gods and there is a slight difference between them. Indra is the good storm god. You see, after the, the hot season, May, June, suddenly the clouds come together and a storm starts. And so suddenly after months of drought, the rain starts and the, the rainy season starts with a big storm. Now that storm is, is, is hoped for, is awaited. When that storm starts, people run out to expose themselves to the raindrops. You know, it's a jubilant affair. And so that's, that's Indra, the, 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 the regular storm world. The storm that's expected and that is part of the annual fertility cycle. Whereas Rudra is the dangerous storm world. You see, if you go for a walk in the mountains, the local people will tell you, be careful. Because, you see, in, in 10 minutes time, a beautiful sky can turn completely and become stormy and dangerous. And so that's Rudra. That's why Rudra is associated with the mountains. And so later he becomes Shiva. Shiva is, of course, associated with the mountains for excellent. Um, but so you have this notion of a storm god all through the Indo-European world. The storm god is like the god par excellence. Because you have many phenomena of nature that are important in human life, like the rain, like the sunshine and so on. But the storm really um, is, a, is, a, is a, a display par excellence of what gods mean for human beings. And namely, they, the, the storm interferes. Suddenly, lightning starts. 
and the lightning may hit some place on earth, some tree may catch fire. And so it's, uh, it's very impressive. You see, the sun is rather predictable. It rises every day and so on. Whereas a thunderstorm, well, you see, there you feel really thrown to the elements. There you really feel that God is powerful in your life, that he interferes. Um, so it is that kind of deity that Moses is confronted with at um, the site of a particular phenomenon in the desert, namely the burning bush. You see, in the desert, certain plants grow that give off ethereal oils. And in the uh, heat of the afternoon, this ethereal oil can catch fire. And so you see a plant and suddenly the plant is on fire. In fact, not the plant itself, but the gaseous substances around it. And if you're not used to that, you see something miraculous. It is like a deity interfered. And so Moses hears a voice. And we'll go into the phenomenon of people hearing voices. But at any rate, the story is that he hears a voice, a voice saying, Moses, take off your shoes because the ground you're standing on is sacred ground. Because this is, this is a temple. This is a, a place where God appears. And so that voice then introduces himself saying, I am Yahweh. Yahweh is interpreted wrongly, but it is interpreted in the Bible as meaning the one who is. He is as a verb form uh, of the verb to be. Now, um, so a whole theology hangs on that etymology, on that word explanation. Now, a um, great orientalist, Julius Wellhausen, writing a uh, hundred years ago, showed that this etymology is a mistake. You see, he deduces it from a different verb which doesn't otherwise exist in the Bible, but it does exist in the Quran. So Arabic and Hebrew are very related. And it means to move in the sky. To move in the sky can have several meanings. Uh, first of all, the stars move in the sky. And so the stars are the gods. The stars are sources of light in heaven. They don't change, and so you, you never see them change, at least. Um, so the daily cycle of the heavenly hosts of the stars in the sky, uh, that is one meaning of this uh, Yahweh, I move in the sky, or he moves in the sky. Um, to move in the sky is also said of an eagle who swoops down on his prey. He sees, he sees there a few miles high. Suddenly he's down here and he takes his prey up. So that's, that's an image of how the divine interferes in human life. The strikes of destiny. And it may be very negative. It may also be very positive. Suddenly you're elevated to a position that you never dreamed of. That's also destiny. And then finally, it simply means, it simply refers to storm. You see the, the wind, you know, the wind that sets up in the desert that causes a sandstorm and so on. Well, that's also an interference of something beyond you in your life. So the real meaning of Yahweh is he moves in the sky. Um, and so that, that verb also appears in the Quran but not in the Bible otherwise. And so the biblical people were not used to this verb and they misinterpreted it. But you see, it was an Arab verb because Moses was living among the Arabs at the time, among the Bedouin. Uh, okay. Now, um, a whole religion is built around that 
simple vision. And so, um, so Moses hears a voice. You can understand, you see, Moses is very agitated. He's a, a fugitive from the law, you know, hiding among the Bedouins. It's a strange new culture, new language that he doesn't much understand. And so in his state of mind, he becomes hypersensitive. And so when he sees this strange sight of the burning bush, the ideas in his mind come alive. And so he's already busy with the question of what is God, what is God like? Very probably, he um, grew up at the Egyptian court exactly at the time of uh, Pharaoh Echnaton, the very first monotheist. You see, he rejected all the Egyptian gods and he thought that the solar disk or atom uh, was the only god. And so this, this lasted for only one generation. But nevertheless, the ideas were alive and clearly some young men growing up at the court, namely Moses, caught this idea. And so this he went over this in his mind. And then when something strange happens, he links the two. This churning of ideas in his head with this strange phenomena. And so he um, he hears a voice. And the little bit that he hears or that he understands of it or what he makes of it, becomes the core of a whole religion. In fact, of several religions in the long run. Okay, then um, he goes back to Egypt and he uh, begins to play a new role. You see, he's fired up by this uh, new religion, by this revelation from God. He's fired up and so now he becomes a leader of the Hebrew people that he has some family connection with, but that he didn't grow up uh, uh, among. And um, the next stage is that all kinds of things happen that he also relates to the workings of God. You see the 10 plagues of Egypt. He tells the Pharaoh, okay, my people and I, we want to leave Egypt. And the Pharaoh says, but no, you see, you're, you're working now, you're building this city. And I need you here. And so Moses threatens, okay, you see, God will punish you if you don't let us go. And then several things happen of which Moses says, okay, this is the working of God. Now here you have a very common thing in the history of religion. Whenever strange things and particularly calamities happen, then always some preacher stands up and says, this is a punishment from God. Um, I remember a uh, 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 decade ago, there was this tsunami, this uh, big uh, water wave in Southeast Asia. And so immediately there were people from different religions, from Islam, but also from Hinduism, uh, standing up and saying, oh, this is a punishment from God. This is because we have a loose lifestyle and because we get too westernized or whatever. You see, whatever the preacher didn't like, he said that that is the reason why God is punishing us. So with the plagues of Egypt, is the same thing. You see, terrible things happen, like the, 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 the plague of the locusts, for example, a well-known one. And so he relates this, oh, it's God who is angry and so on. You have to give in to our demands because God is angry. And then finally, the worst plague is that all the um, the firstborn of the Egyptian families die. This is a punishment from God. Here you see again this Israelite obsession with the giving up of the firstborn to God. Um, anyway, so some plague happens that is formulated in the Bible as the killing of the firstborn. 
And so then the Pharaoh gives in and he allows Moses and his people to go. Now, they um, trek through the desert for 40 years. In fact, it's a fairly short distance, even in the uncomfortable uh, conditions of desert life. It takes only a week or so to cover the distance. Anyway, they take 40 years. And so sometime during that period, um, Moses sets up a big show around the mountain, Mount Sinai. And I say a big show because the Bible actually describes that trumpets are blowing and smoke is coming out and so on. It's a really impressive thing. And so the people down at the foot of the mountain are watching in awe. And so Moses goes up and um, there God gives him the Ten Commandments. There are two tables um, with two types of commandments. The second table contains very normal human commandments, rules that most societies observe that they already observed for thousands of years before Moses. They didn't need any divine revelation for that. Because it says things like, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, and so on. These are perfectly normal rules, developed by people out of experience. If you have a society where everybody steals from one another, this causes a lot of problems and disunity and internal fighting and so on. A society like that is brittle, is weak, and gets defeated easily by its enemies. So you don't want that. So you develop a rule, okay, no stealing, no coveting each other's spouses, no killing, of course. And um, so for that, they didn't need any divine revelation you see this this second second uh, table materially speaking these commandments are on two stone tables so the second one is really only there to give more authority to the first you see when when you say okay thou shalt not steal that's like obvious nobody's going to doubt that and so if nobody's going to doubt that, then maybe also nobody's going to doubt the other table, which has a different kind of commandments, namely a new theology, where God says, okay, I'm a jealous God. I do not tolerate a second God beside me. You can only worship me and no one else. He also gives the commandment, that we shall not make graven images. We should not make murtis, not make ratimas, no likenesses of God, because they're nothing like God. And so all the likenesses of God that you make do injustice to him. Right? So that's a new theology. Not entirely new. As I said, in the Egyptian court, you had that Pharaoh Echnaton, one or two generations earlier, who already introduced this monotheism. And so the innovation of Moses to bring in monotheism is historically very probably derivative from Pharaoh Echnaton's uh, monotheism. Anyway, so he introduces this and he creates the impression that this comes straight from God. Then, now that he has the ear of God, now that he has opened the telephone line with God, God tells him some more. You see, before he goes, Moses goes up on the mountain, he arranges with his brother Aaron, and Aaron makes a murti to test the people. You see, he seduces them 
into idolatry. So they make a murti of the god Baal. And so Baal, just like Shiva, uh, is identified with a bull. So they make a statue of a bull. This is the famous statue of the golden cow. Mind you, where does the golden cow come from? Well, all the people who want to worship Baal, they give their jewels. So they are not greedy. You see, many people think that the cult of the golden calf has something to do with greed, with materialism. No, it's just the opposite. They give away their own worldly riches in order to be able to worship the deity Baal. Anyway, why does Aaron do this? Why does he make them worship a false god? Well, you see, Moses comes down from the mountain and he sees the people worshiping this other god, not Yahweh, but Baal. And he gets very angry and he has his brother Aaron put to the sword 3,000 worshippers of the golden cup. You see, you can compare it to uh, Mao Zedong. Mao Zedong of the Chinese Communist Party in the early 50s, he started a campaign, let a hundred flowers bloom, let a hundred thoughts compete where he invited people to come out with all the criticism they had against the party. Many people did. And then the next move, okay, now everybody has stuck his head out. Now let's chop them all off. The next move was the anti-rightists campaign, in which all the people who had dared to criticize the Communist Party were suddenly criminals, were suddenly persecuted. So this is exactly what happened with the golden cow. First, it is Aaron, the brother of Moses, who comes out and seduces people. Come on, let's worship the golden cow. And whoever does so is later punished for it. And so this is not, at least according to the book, this is not Moses' little idea. No, no, it's God who commands all. And so it's God who commands all these people to be killed. Then next move is uh, Moses dies and his people under the leadership of Joshua enter the promised land where they set out to kill all the natives. So they take the land, but not with the natives as slaves or anything. No, they kill all the natives. They want no taint of any prior culture. They want to, you know, set set up their own kingdom in a vacuum. And again, it's God who commands them. So here you see, well, <laughs> what is dangerous about prophetism is that, you see, God is free to tell you anything, and then you have to do it because it comes from God. And so he may order no less than genocide. Then, um, okay, you see, Israel sets up a kingdom, King David, and so on. You have a certain evolution. And the um, history of prophecy comes to the fore again in the next phase when the kingdom of Israel is threatened. So... In the year 722 BC, uh, it's the northern half of the kingdom that gets conquered by Assyria, one of the great powers of the time. And all the people get deported. They don't get murdered, but they get, um, uh, they get uh, separated from their homeland and as much as possible from one another. And they have to just mix with the general population of Assyria, present-day Syria, northern Iraq. And they simply disappear. Then the southern half 
in 589 is conquered by Babylon and the elite is deported to Babylon. And so for about 50 years, they live in Babylon. And it is there that the Israelite religion really is formed. Then also all the traditions are committed to writing. And so shortly after the Persians then conquered Babylon, they let the people go home again. They rebuild the temple that had been broken down by the Babylonians. And then you see the religion comes in, in full force. From then on, you get monotheism. It's no longer struggling to assert itself. No, it's there. It's the only game in town. And um, now it is in that context that, again, you find a few prophets who, um, again, are rather bizarre people. If you study their persons closely, you mainly have um, uh, Ezekiel, Isaiah and Jeremiah. Um, Isaiah is perhaps best known for announcing the Messiah. The Messiah is a different kind of intervention of God. So, so far, we have prophecy, that is to say, God speaks to man. And you have some privileged individuals who take the word of God and make them public. They are the prophets. Here you get something else. The Messiah, that's no longer God um, sending his words. No, here God is sending a person. But, you see, Messiah originally in Judaism means um, the anointed one. That's the literal meaning of Messiah or its Greek translation, Christus, Christ. Um, so originally it means the anointed one, which is the crown prince. You see the, the prince who is uh, anointed to take the crown when time comes, when his father dies. And um, so the idea of the Messiah means a restoration of Israelite sovereignty. So Israel had a kingdom under King David. Then the Babylonians conquer it, no more kingdom. And so they are prisoners in Babylon. Then the Persians come. The Persians restore their religion, restore their freedom, but nevertheless, they are not subjects of the Persian Empire. And so the idea of the Messiah means that someone from the, from the lineage of King David a grandson of King David or so, is going to come and restore the kingdom, restore Israelite sovereignty. So it's a purely political concept. So that's the Messiah. And so the idea of the Messiah is a variation on the idea of prophecy in the sense that both uh, represent an intervention of the divine in the human world. Now, then you get uh, quite a few people who think they hear the voice of God. Um, like not too long before Christ, you get Enoch, you see, who thinks that he is uh, privy to scenes from heaven, describing what happens in heaven. You see, describing God face to face. Um, so you have quite a few of those. You see, prophecy is a genre in its own right. And so it's in, in that culture where that idea of prophecy flourishes that Jesus comes around. And so, again, you see there are several elements of prophecy of God speaking in the life of Jesus. It starts with the annunciation of his birth. So supposedly the Holy Spirit appears and he um, tells Joseph, the fiancé of Mary, that Mary is going to get pregnant 
and that her son is going to be Jesus, the anointed one, the Messiah. Now here again, you see this is all God talking. And so people with a lot of imagination, and I've known quite a few in my lifetime, easily fall for this. You see, they hear voices, they channel intelligences. I mean, even nowadays in the Western New Age scene, you have plenty of people really believing that they hear the voice either of deceased people whom they have known or from, you know, spirits living on the other side. Um, so back in those days too, you see this, uh, I mean, critical thinking was very limited, was very developed, and so people easily fell for this story of orders and intelligence up there speaking to me. And so it goes on. During Jesus' life too, he himself hears the voice of God. At one point, there's another preacher, John the Baptist. He conducts baptisms. He, he baptizes people in the river. You know, they immerse themselves in the water and come up again. Um, which is a, a, a ritual that exists in many parts of the world. There's nothing specifically Judaic or Christian about it. It is like in the Ganga, taking a holy dip in Ganga, uh, the way that uh, Swamis are anointed is often also is a uh, immersion in the in the Ganga. Um, but so. John the Baptist did the same thing, so he uh, puts Jesus' head under the water, then he comes up again. And this is a quite moving experience for Jesus. Uh, and so suddenly he hears a voice from above. A voice from above who says, okay, this is, uh, this is the one... I, I care about God speaking, God saying, okay, this here, Jesus, you know, he is, he is, uh, the son of God. He is the one in whom I take pleasure. Now, there are four gospels, as you know. The life of Jesus is told four times. In fact, there are more of them, but the church has acknowledged only four of them. And those four, Bible scholars have more or less established when they were written. And when you take the sequence of those four Gospels, you see that the same story is told again and again and again. And what is at first completely subjective, Jesus who hears a voice from above, becomes ever more objective. You see, in the next one, everybody hears that voice. And in the next one, it doesn't even matter that anybody hears that voice. It simply says there is a voice from above. Because this is, it becomes ever more real. You can see how a myth is born. You see, first somebody has a completely subjective experience of hearing a voice. And then it gets said that this is just an objective fact. God speaks to me. Okay. So, in fact, that is the, um, that is the uh, case of uh, prophetism par excellence, where Jesus himself hears a voice that turns him into the Messiah, that turns him into the one sent by God. Okay, so now I've given an overview of what uh, the stories of prophetism are in the Bible. Um, of course, I ought to go on and tell the same story about the Quran, but I think that would be a lecture in its own right. Okay, the role of prophetism within the Quran. In fact, for the um, for history's sake, I may tell you that. Uh, this story about prophetism in the Bible is something I've discussed with uh, Sitaram Goel at one time before publishing this little book about uh, psychology of prophetism. 
And then already I said, well, you see, the same story can be told about uh, Muhammad. And at that time he said, well, be careful, you see. Well, you have to <laughs> think twice because this is a dangerous thing to say. Uh, let's first, let's first tell the story about prophetism in the Bible. So that's when I've written that little book, uh, Psychology of Prophetism. The story about, uh, Muhammad, I have told later in, uh, a book called The Problem of Secularism. And so there's a chapter in that book, uh, about Wahi. Wahi is the trance, the mental state, the altered state of consciousness that Muhammad went through when he received his revelations. Right? That's called Wahi, the supernatural basis of Islam. It was published in 2007, but tucked away in a book about secularism. That was a bit of a safety measure, and that was not superfluous because the article has been translated into Tamil, fortunately under pseudonym, and the Tamil translator got uh, death threats. So fortunately they couldn't find him. Anyway, so that's a, a, a later story. Of course, Sitaram Goel himself has also told that story to a large extent in his introduction to the final edition of the book, the Calcutta Quran Petition. So both him and myself have worked on the psychology of prophetism in the case of Muhammad. But I propose that we keep that for a next occasion. I mean, it's a long story. It will easily fill a few hours. Uh, and for now, limit us to uh, the case of the Bible. Now, um, when Bible scholarship came of age, Modern, rational, scientific uh, scholars were not inclined to take the Bible's word for it. This starts with uh, Spinoza in the 17th century. He was born as a Jew, lived in the Netherlands, and he was excommunicated by the Jewish community. They didn't like his rational approach. And he himself, conversely, also didn't like the Bible broke with it, and he started the critical study of the Bible. So the, he was no longer a believer looking up to the Bible. No, no. He took the Bible and read it critically. And so from there onwards, more and more scholars start approaching the Bible in this critical manner. Now, one thing that Bible scholars uh, understood is that this uh, invocation by the prophets of some divine source is very questionable. Indeed, if you go to a mental hospital, and in fact, as a student during summers, I have worked in a mental hospital, and I've seen for myself that you always find a few people in there who think they are hearing voices from above. And the people who end up in a psychiatric hospital are mostly bad cases. But you have everything in between. You see, you have normal people. You have very abnormal people who completely stand out, whom nobody is going to believe who are so obviously crazy. But then you have everything in between. And so you have quite a few people who look normal and yet who have this strange fantasy deep inside them that some voice from heaven is dictating things to them. And so this is where you have to look for the prophets. You see, they're not just crazy people who hear voices. And they're not entirely normal. They are in between. 
So privately, they have the strange behavior of hearing voices and thinking they are real and acting upon them. But otherwise, they live in society, they have a job, they, they, you know, they are normal. And therefore, they can have authority. They are not like the village idiots who behave strangely. No, no, you see, they are people of authority. Yet they also have this funny belief that they hear, that they hear a voice. So this is mostly where you have to situate the biblical prophets. Now, in the early 20th century, several psychiatrists came to the insight if you study Jesus, if you see just what the gospel says, you don't even have to go beyond the gospel and doubt the gospel. No, no. Take the testimony of the gospel itself. You can see that Jesus is a very bizarre character. You know, like he gets baptized and suddenly he hears the voice of God telling him, oh, you are special. You are the son of God. Well, then they connect the dots. They say, okay, in the case of Jesus, we know quite a lot. You see, the, um, the, uh, the biblical prophets, Ezekiel and Isaiah, and so on, we know very little about their personal life. In the case of Jesus, we know a little bit more. I mean, we have four books devoted to his life and others that are apocryphal that were not recognized by the church, but that are also that have been meant as testimonies about Jesus' life. So we know quite a bit about him. Um, there are, among these apocryphal Gospels, versions that say that Jesus had doubts about his paternity. So, and I mean, this, this, happens, this happens today and this happens throughout history that uh, women got pregnant, often didn't know who the father was or knew very well who the father was, but had their reasons to be discreet about it. Like the father was some famous person who, you know, couldn't use this, uh, an extra son on the side who would get ambitious later on and so on. No, no. So, you know, he paid the mother off. Okay, you see, I'll... Uh, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll keep you alive, but you have to shut your mouth. You know, forget about this being my son. Um, and other stories like that. Anyway, so Jesus was a son without a father. And this easily, easily get translated into a myth making. Oh, my father is very special. In this case, even very special, my father is God himself, is the Holy Ghost. And so in one of these apocryphal gospels, actually, Jesus as a child in the playground is taunted by the others. They say, at least we know who our father is. You don't. So clearly Jesus had a paternity problem. And so, in his personal fantasies, you see, this gets filled in. Okay, I am the son of God. Now, we don't know this in detail. You see, we only have the version of the gospel. Now, the gospel is quite unreliable as a source of history. You see, uh, the only thing we really agree on is that a character called Jesus must have existed. He was, of course, not the son of God. He did not work miracles. But roughly, the, the gospel uh, correctly says about him that he was a wandering healer, or he thought himself uh, to be a healer. He was a wandering exorcist, because it's all described in the Bible what he does. He drives out spirits. You see, and so certain diseases are not black or white. Like, for instance, epilepsy. When you get an epileptic attack, you know, 
for an hour or so you are not yourself, you fall down, you get unconscious, but then you come back. And so if you're uh, a healer and you're there at that time, you can easily create the impression that you have resurrected this epilepsy. That you, because of your concerns, your ministrations, you have caused the epileptic attack to subside and, and bring the person back to consciousness. And so Jesus himself even may have believed that he was healing people. And so a number of these healings are described in the gospel. Um, it's in fact very honestly admitted by one of the gospel writers that in some cases Jesus didn't succeed in doing miracles in healing people, which is very realistic. So sometimes he managed to create the impression, among others, and also and especially in himself, that he could affect healings. And so he must have started thinking very highly about it. Now, I personally, I worked uh, for some years in a New Age bookstore, and I met all kinds of people there. And so... <laughs> You do have these people like, you know, channelers, people who think that they channel intelligences on the other side, either deceased people whom they have known or other, you know, spirits from the great beyond. And they genuinely think that they can channel these voices, that they can represent these intelligences here on earth. So you get all kinds of strange beliefs. And so it is in that world that a certain Jesus operated. And so he was fairly special. He may also have uh, gradually drawn this scriptural tradition about the Messiah to himself, really believed he was the Messiah, and then said so also, I am the Messiah. This is what he says when questioned by the Jewish scholars and the Sanhedrin. And so that may have drawn negative attention to him from the Orthodox Jews and then ultimately from the Roman authorities. So everything that happens there is quite explainable. It doesn't require any intervention of God. It's just a human belief. You know, people are not entirely rational. They can easily be swayed. They are gullible. And so these beliefs came about. Then later, once Jesus had made his name somewhat, then myths prevalent in the, in the ambient culture were then projected onto him. The resurrection, you see, the Son of God, the redemption. You see, Jesus, by his death and resurrection, redeems mankind, frees us, liberates us from sin, from the inherent sinfulness that we have inherited from Adam and Eve. Uh, but so those things came later, you know, were projected into it. But you see, Jesus as a historical character very probably existed. Only, you see, he uncritically, he naively, he exaltedly thought big things about himself thought big things about voices he heard. And, you know, with our modern critical outlook on this, we just don't follow him in that view. So finally, um, let me uh, honor the work of these modern uh, psychologists who have analyzed the behavior of some prophets like Abraham and especially of Jesus uh, in the 20th century. Um, so they started applying modern techniques of diagnosis to the case of Jesus. And so a number of them um, came to the conclusion, well, you see, this was not a normal person. This was a, some kind of a psychopath. 
And so I myself have known Dr. Hermann Somers, who was an ex-Jesuit. He was a real Jesuit. He had three PhD degrees and some more diplomas. Uh, you know, he was very learned. But you see, because he studied the psychology of the prophets and particularly of Jesus, he came to the insight, well, this man was abnormal. This man was sick in his mind. That's all there is to it. So he started doubting Christianity. Therefore, also, he started doubting his own vocation as a Jesuit. So he left the Jesuit order. He left the Catholic Church. Um, so he, he had the courage of his conviction. You see, his life changed completely because of what he had understood about uh, Jesus and about the prophets. And so he concluded that, you know, there are, there is still much to do with human consciousness. Only it does not lie in the belief in any revelation, in any prophet, in any messiah. You see, those things, you see, mankind has grown up and shouldn't believe in these children's stories anymore. These are fairy tales, these are stories that came about when our human level of consciousness was not what it is today. And so we should outgrow those beliefs. The prophetism, there are no divine revelations. We have our human consciousness that is capable of great things, like the Vedas, for example. The Vedas are a collection of human poetry made by men, not dictated by gods. And it's great. And in fact, you can fill, you can fill a lifetime, you can fill a civilization with the Vedas and the traditions that they brought forth. As long as you don't make the mistake of thinking, oh, this is a divine revelation. No, you see, this shows the genius of mankind. This is a level of consciousness to which mankind, to which we have risen. There is no, no divinity involved, except in the sense that we all partake in divinity. There is something divine in each of us. And so a spark of the divine speaks through creations like the Vedic hymns, right? So... Religion as such is not, is not uh, outdated, but certain beliefs, and especially the most irrational beliefs, they are outdated, and we really should outgrow them. That was a wonderful, wonderful uh, talk that you gave, and uh, somehow when you said that about the paternity thing, it kind of resonated with the Hitler story, Adolf Hitler. Um, yes. He also had some paternity issue, I think. Yes. I, I what I read, and then he <laughs> went berserk. With so, does this uh, kind of uh, have the same psychology here happening? I mean, that's one. Question. Well. <laughs> Uh, it's very certain that um, doubts about paternity or about one's biological identity uh, are a source of psychic trouble in very many people. Um, nowadays, you have this phenomenon of um, donor children. You see women who go to some 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 sperm donor center to get artificially inseminated and then they don't know who the father is. And for them, okay, well, they can live with it. But for the children, this is really a crisis, you know, to, to, to not know who your father was. Um, and so you can see that this creates a lot of, a lot of uh, psychological problems in those children. I mean, now there are thousands of them. And, um, so imagine back in those days also when morality was a lot stricter. I mean, now you can be a single mom. Uh, back then it was a great shame. And children were taunted, you see, if, if they didn't know who their father was or if their father wasn't with them anymore. 
uh, that was a far greater shame back then than it is today. So you can imagine, you see, this led to all kinds of aberrations. And so thinking that you're the son of God is, is only one of them. Hello, uh, hello, um, comrade. Good, good, good to see you again. You, you look ah. even more, more like an Old Testament prophet than you did a few <laughs> months ago with the beard. Yeah, very, very impressive. Uh, yeah, oh, uh, that's a, you know, fascinating talk. Really, really, um, enjoyed it. Um, the, the, several sort of thoughts. I mean, the, the, the first question I was going to ask, I think you may have, have partially answered it. Uh, I, I was going to ask, what do you think is a better model for the, the the way in which the human can interact and communicate with with the divine? But I, I think towards the end you you spoke really about um, it, it seemed to imply it's better to think of the divine as being part of ourselves. So this yes. idea of of the um, uh, figure that exists outside of the world speaking to us is 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 not is not a good model, and I mm -hmm. I, I, I would agree with that. Um, but c coming back to a, a, another thing that you, you you said, I, I think it's maybe over sixty percent of the inhabitants of the world follow religions that have got this revelation model, and it, it that suggests to me that uh, most people do have a natural tendency to want this very authoritative message. Uh, and maybe we should think about trying to make sure. I don't. Know, we, we maybe have to come to terms with our own psychology that that lots of people do want that. I don't know. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> it's it's a problem. You see, I've been thinking about a lot the, the last few years. You see, uh, to to deal with this uh, as a, as a theology, as a, as an ideology. As a philosophical system, that's one thing. If it is show that the belief in prophecy is a mistake, the belief in voices from above is a mistake, that's one thing. And, you know, that's fairly easy to show. And in fact, you see, religions themselves are good at showing it. Because even if religions themselves have irrational beliefs, they are good at showing up the irrationality of other religions. Like, for instance, the Islamic argument against the belief that Jesus is the Son of God or that Jesus was resurrected. You see, in Islam, they say, no, you see, he wasn't really dead. You know, he was, uh, you know, he seemed to be dead, but he wasn't dead. And so there was no resurrection. You know, or maybe there was a stand-in, somebody else died, and he himself survived and, and he came back. And so his believers, his followers thought that he had resurrected. Okay, you see, so the, the Islamic critique of the Christian belief in resurrection is quite rational. You know, <laughs> it makes a lot of sense. And so the different religions are good at criticizing one another. When they try to, you know, hold up their own beliefs, now that's different. But in seeing the weakness of the other beliefs, that's good. That, that, that they're good at. Um, so, um, these beliefs, like the Christian belief in the resurrection, are not really necessary. You see, why do people join Christianity? Nowadays, you see, mostly people leave Christianity. But yes, there still are people who join Christianity. Now, why is that? It is very rarely because of the theology. You see, it's only later that people start discovering this theology. Initially, they are attracted to Christian people they know. And so sometimes, you know, Christian churches show their best faith and are attractive to people in certain difficult circumstances. Like in India, it's especially poverty, you know, rice Christians. Uh, Hindus who convert to Christianity because then they think they come on a gravy train that then money collected in Texas is going to come to their place in India and life becomes easier. Uh, um, so 
usually you see joining a religion it has this form like you see it with all these little religions now like you know for instance here in belgium you know you have quite a few african immigrants i don't speak about muslim immigrants i mean people from congo or so and so they flock to christian churches you know these kind of uh, protestant or or charismatic catholic churches where they do a lot of, you know, experiencing ecstatic dancing and so on, stuff that Europeans wouldn't associate with Christianity at all. But so they feel a certain warmth, a certain community there. And you shouldn't trouble them with too much questions about, you know, the, 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 the theology of Christianity. Most of them don't know anything about it or they start learning about it later. When the church authorities say, okay, now you see, now you're into this church. Now let's take you through some courses of, you know, what really is our doctrine. But so mostly that's not the reason why people convert. And, um, so I, um, I mean, with showing why religions are false, with that, I, I'm really ready. I mean, I see through the whole game. They can't teach me anything anymore. But now the question is, how do you bring this to people? Like, you know, like this Herman Somers that I mentioned, this ex-Jesuit. You see, he told me how his world crumbled, fell apart when he realized, oh my God, you see, all these decades, I've believed in a fairy tale. You know, and for an ex-Jesuit, it doesn't have any practical consequences because he has a very high education. He can immediately get another job in some university or so. For them, life goes on. But imagine the situation of all these mullahs, of all these Islamic scripture scholars. You see, they've spent their whole lives studying all these totally useless lore about, you know, what Muhammad said or did in this circumstance or that circumstance, how that shades over into the practical legislation of Islam today, Islamic society. They have become expert at this. They know all about what Muhammad did in this or that circumstance. And then you explain to them the sources of Islam and they start seeing, oh my God, Islam is a mistake. Now for them, at the human level, that means that they've spent all these years on a mistake. You see, imagine you yourself have studied all these, you know, physics textbooks and so on. You learned about the law of gravity and so on. By and large, this is true. You see, airplanes can't fly if the law of gravity is wrong. So all the time you have this confirmation of the stuff that you learn. Now, if you've learned everything about Islam and you start thinking lucidly about it, you will see it crumble. It does not get confirmed. It's all a mistake. Now, you see, for these people, uh, that's, that causes a crisis. You see, they spend all their lives building an expertise that is an expertise of nothing, of a fairy tale. So you see, that's, that's right now what, what puzzles me is how can we get people to outgrow Islam, to outgrow Christianity, without creating too much of a human crisis. And so there are a number of elements that help here. Like uh, the criticism that religions have of other religions, you know, that reminds them that they are already familiar with the practice mm -hmm. of deconstructing religious doctrines, namely those of the others. Like, for instance, Muslims are all familiar with telling Hindus 
that idolatry is silly, idolatry is wrong, and so on. They are totally familiar with uprooting other people's beliefs. So to uproot their own beliefs is not such a big step. You can explain that. But then there are also many things in religion that simply that they can keep. Like, for instance, the pilgrimage to Mecca existed already before Islam. In fact, it is totally idolatrous. Because if you believe in Allah, well, Allah is everywhere. You can't go on pilgrimage to the omnipresent one. You, you go on pilgrimage to a specific place because that place is different from all the rest. So there are many things in Islam that you can keep. Like, for instance, in the Quran, uh, there are certain virtues that are emphasized by Muhammad, like honesty and like patience. Now, you see, there is nothing wrong with this. Value, you know, and so there's quite a bit in these religions that can remain. Like in the Bible, for instance, you have many teachings that you could call biblical because they happen to be in the Bible, but that are not anything specifically monotheist or prophetic or something like take for instance in the book of Ecclesiastes or Kohelet the book of the Old Testament you have a text that has become famous as a song to everything turn 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 now you see there's nothing wrong with that that phrase that insight there's nothing specifically monotheist or so about it. It simply says, uh, you know, if you look at the year and all the seasons, you can see that to everything there is a season. There is a season for thaw, there is a season for harvest. There is a season for cold, there is a season for heat, and so on. Um, so that's a good thing in the Bible. There's nothing wrong with that. And even if we say that, you see, prophetism belief in hearing voices and so on, this is silly, okay, but a whole lot, and, and, and you know, a, a very large part of the pages in between the first and last page of the Bible do make sense. And so that way, you can make the outgrowing of Islam and Christianity uh, a more digestible process. I mean, it seems, seems to me um, that uh, it, it, that there is ample empirical evidence to suggest that the condition we're in is that our irrational side is much more powerful than our rational side, which is why uh, you know, we have we have the religious landscape that, that we have. Uh, what what do you what do you think about that? I mean, we we had the psychology that we have because we've evolved in a certain way. Well, I don't know if. Um the irrational side is that much stronger. Um, I mean, it's like people used to believe in geocentrism. Once somebody explained to them the heliocentric model and showed how this is much more convincing and gives a far better account of the data of the things we observe, then you can't go back. You see, people may may send me propaganda for the geocentric model. I simply can't go back to it. You know, it's like it's like you tell small children that that babies are brought by a stork, or that they grow inside a cabbage. I mean, there are these these stories for children. Now, once you know where babies really come from how uh, they really are made, you can't go back to these children's stories, no matter how much they are propagated. Uh, so I think <laughs> you know, there's nothing healthier than exposure to the truth. And so once you see um, how these beliefs in prophetism in voices from the other side and so on are produced, are created, well, once you see through them, you can't fall for them anymore. And so I think it's a good thing to outgrow them. Only I, I agree that for some time, you see, the, the transitional period is difficult. 
Now, I remember from my own youth, you know, back then I myself and most people around me were outgrowing the belief in Catholicism. And so I know what, what crisis people go through. I've gone through it myself. And I've seen very many people around me go through it. Like, for instance, the typical stage is that people say, yeah, I don't believe in the church anymore, but the Bible, yeah, now I've started reading the Bible, mm. but in my own way. And, and so, you see, piece after piece is then left behind. The things that you still believe in, after a while, you see, you outgrow them, you become more familiar with the non-religious society around you. And you start seeing that ideas that you were attached to, you don't need to be attached to anymore. You know, you, you can just, just I mean, you, you peel them off and they just disappear. It becomes easier and easier. The, the, uh, in, uh, we will see whether that proves to be the case empirically, because if what you're saying is the case, then Islam will, of its own, uh, of its own shortcomings, it, it will collapse. But it, it, it doesn't seem to be doing that in, in England. But anyway. I have a question which might not be related to this topic, but I'll still ask mm -hmm. it. So you're the best person. Now, there are different versions of uh, Mark and Luke and all these people as to how Jesus died on the cross. Some said that he said that, uh, why have you forsaken me? And some said that he, that he didn't say that. Some said he drank the uh, beer, some said he drank wine and some was some said he was uh, so why this difference when you're seeing the same event in front of you why this difference in uh, in representation in yeah well well first of all there are of course four gospels they are mostly convergent but sometimes also different um, then you have different uh, interpretations within Christianity. The main, uh, the main cleavage is between Catholics and Protestants. That's uh, also a situation you do see in India. And indeed, <laughs> you see, knowing where all these stories come from, I always find it very amusing to see Indian Christians disagree among each other uh, about points that Catholics and Protestants have disagreed on for centuries outside India. And, um, like, for example, um, Protestants say that Christianity started with Jesus, whereas Catholicism started with the Emperor Constantine, who called the first council Nicene Council, where the creed was formulated. That is to say, the official doctrine of Christianity was formulated. So that's central to the Catholic Church, but that's also taken over by most Protestant sects, except certain very radical ones that really don't accept anything except what is in the Bible. Like uh, an example, the Jehovah's Witnesses. They are really very Bible solid and they don't accept anything outside it. Now, they are, for example, against Christmas. You see, now it is Christ Christmas is a, is, a, is a battlefield. You see, the woke people, um, they, uh, they say, oh, you can't say Merry Christmas anymore. You have to say Happy Season or Season's Greetings, you know. And it's no longer Christmas uh, holiday, it's a uh, uh, winter holiday, and so on. So from that angle, there's something wrong with Christmas. Now, from the opposite angle, from the ultra-Christian, ultra-biblical angle, there is also something wrong with Christmas. Namely, Christmas is not in the Bible. Jesus didn't celebrate Christmas. <laughs> And so the whole saints calendar of the Catholic Church with All Saints Day, with Christmas, with um, Mary's Assumption Day on 15th of August and so on, all this is unbiblical. 
it's not in the gospel. Jesus didn't do it. Jesus had never heard of it. You see, the only the only festivals they accept are, of course, Easter. That is described in the Bible that Jesus was resurrected the day after the Jewish Passover. Um, and then linked with it 40 days after is um, uh, Jesus' uh, ascension to heaven. And then 50 days after is the Pentecost, the, the Holy Spirit. So those, those festivals are described in the New Testament. But all the others are not. Um, so, you know, really b- biblical Christians reject most of, most of the Catholic tradition. And so, you see, in India, you have all these people that just believe what the missionaries tell them, not knowing the whole story that went before of all the theological debates within Christianity for centuries on end in Europe. Um, anyway, why was I saying this? It was an answer to something you asked. Did you forget my question? Well, you see, that, that's, that's precisely why I'm wondering, have I answered your question? I think uh, partly you did in the beginning. You said that, I mean, you know where all these stories come from, but we tend yeah. to leave it as it is. And I was just referring to the different versions uh, in the books regarding Oh, the- yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, of course. Well, of course, there are also genuinely difficult questions that, that learned uh, scholars discuss. Um, there are certain certain parts in the New Testament that you really wonder, you see, what is meant? And sometimes, very sometimes, new discoveries are made. I mean, this is what you have in any historical discipline, that a new discovery can suddenly throw a completely new light on things. And so in the 19th, 20th century, uh, our knowledge of the um, of everything that determines the meaning of the gospel, including uh Jewish customs, uh Greek or Roman customs and so on. That knowledge has deepened. And so here and there we have come to understand better what is meant by gospel phrases. But by and large, by and large we know what Christianity is and so these these one or two phrases are not going to make the difference. And so my point is Christianity is a mistake. You see, Christianity says very simple. Um, first of all, of course, God created the world, including mankind. Then he created us free, and we misused our freedom to sin. And so we fell from our paradisiacal state into the state of sinfulness. We became mortal. And then God had mercy on us. And he sent his only son, Jesus. And just like the ancient Hebrews did, they sacrificed their firstborn. So God also sacrificed his firstborn. He let Jesus die. But then he brought Jesus back to life. And that made all the difference. He conquered death. Now for us, sinfulness is linked with death. First, we were immortal, then we fell into sin, and we fell into mortality. So now, Jesus has conquered sin, and he has conquered mortality. So now we have eternal life. Not that you can see that, because everybody keeps dying. But somehow, there is Christian belief that we have earned immortality. Um which to Hindus is a strange thing because for them immortality is taken for granted. Everybody is already immortal. But okay, (laughs) so death and sin are the great um, trouble spots in Christianity and they define Christ as having the answer to these problems. Now, I think that simply is a mistake um in 33 uh when Jesus died and supposedly was resurrected 
there was no appreciable lessening of human sinfulness. There was no end to human mortality. I mean, nothing happened. And so why did nothing happen? Well, because it was all a fantasy. People imagined this, this resurrection and nothing really happened. So let's outgrow that. In fact, it's not so difficult. Let's outgrow this, uh, this immature belief and look at, you know, what the real human problem is, what we really can do about this. So uh, here I want to ask that uh, how um, appropriate is it to bring in psychology um, in matters of uh, divinity, you know, because sometimes people say that there is this Oedipus complex, you know, which uh, Sigmund Freud had said between a mother and a son and a father. And they said, don't go into that zone, you know, don't go into that relationship, which you don't understand or something like that. So psychology in, in divinity, psychology, which is, uh, I mean, in these texts where supposedly people say that you don't understand it because you've not attained samadhi and you've not done this and that. So I'm just asking uh, on behalf of all those kind of questions, what exactly do you have to say? Yeah, you know, Sigmund Freud as a psychiatrist is really very, very, very outdated. But as a thinker about fundamental things, and especially a religion, I think it's pretty good. You see, he has uh, two books that I think are still valid. One is about Derman Moses, uh, meaning, you know, Moses and the genesis of monotheism, where he explains that Moses really was an Egyptian. In fact, the name Moses is an Egyptian name. It means son of... Um, and so because of his particular situation, he developed this particular ideology that then became the source of Judaism, later of Christianity and Islam. Um, and then he has a second book about religion, the future of an illusion, where, you know, he takes the modern rationalist viewpoint that well, you see, religion is part of, let's say, the childhood stage of humanity. And so as we become more scientific, we outgrow religion. And so, so you see, religion is, is, is an interesting memory. You see, there was, it was an interesting time in history when people believed, but now we don't believe anymore. And, um, so you get a, quite a revival of religion in the last few decades, but still, you see, it's not the same what it used to be. In Islam, still, you have a tendency to, to repeat the Islam of Muhammad, to go back to the past, um, though less and less, like you, you have heard that in Saudi Arabia, they just outlawed the Tablighi Jamaat, uh, they outlawed several terrorist groups. Many Arab countries have thrown out the, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, the Islam. Um, and so also you see that more and more in Islam, they are giving in to modern norms, not yet Hindu or Chinese norms, mostly still Western, but that horizon will keep on widening. Don't worry. This is going to happen. Uh, but so they are already susceptible to listening to non-Islamic sources and, and getting influenced by these non-Islamic sources. So this growing out of religion is a process that is happening. Now, some people will not like me to say growing out of religion because they will say, ah, but Hinduism is okay. Well, you see, here I am using religion in the meaning given to it by Christians. Religion originally means religiosity. It's not connected to any certain doctrine. You see, in the Greek or Roman world, just like in the Hindu world today, you had a religious landscape with all kinds of events in it, with movements and gurus and 
you know, attracting pupils for a while, then they go somewhere else and they keep on discovering and renewing and so on. There is no fixed doctrine. The word religion originally means utmost attention. You know, you still use it like that in English. To do something religiously means to do something with utmost attention. Okay, so that's the original meaning of religion. That, there's nothing wrong with. And that's not outdated. However, Christianity gave it a new meaning, namely a religious doctrine. You stand by a religious doctrine. So from then on, you don't just have religion, an unending landscape of religion. No, you get one religion centered around one doctrine. Then you have another religion centered around another doctrine. Islam and Christianity are two different religions. Um, so religion in that sense is out there. And we are outgrowing that. You can see in Christianity, especially in the Catholic Church, that they are gradually shedding the characteristic Catholic beliefs, like the belief in their own unicity, outside the church, no salvation. That idea is giving way. I mean, I can see it all around me. Like I read every every week the um, the weekly of the Catholics here in my country, and so I can see that uh, this exclusivism that is typical of Christianity. You see, this is not not really believed anymore. That's still church teaching officially, but nobody believes in it anymore. Nobody's going to say, "Oh, we are going to heaven," and those Protestants. And those Hindus and so on, they are all going to hell. You know, nobody really believes that anymore, even though it's still on the books. Um, so, you know, this is evolving. In Islam, too, I see it evolving. And so, you know, you have, you have people who uphold the old Islam, the, the Islam of the Prophet. And they still create a lot of news in the sense that they throw bombs and so on. And, and they kill people. They kill dissident writers and bloggers in Bangladesh and in Nigeria and in India, in France. Um, but so, so compared to their number, they still create a lot of news. But in fact, you see, the number of real Muslims is diminishing. And so more and more, they are absorbing from the general atmosphere modern beliefs of the, the relativity of, of these religious doctrines and so on. So they're becoming gradually a bit more inclusive, a bit more self-doubting. This is healthy. Um, so yes, you see, this, this revival of religions has happened ever since Khomeini came to power and so on. But um, still, you see, that's, that's a very temporary thing. It's like if you study, in physics, if you study some, some wave that is going down, it's not going down straight, it's going down with waves. And so for a while, you see it go up again. But in fact, this is part of a process where it will go down even more steeply. And um, so that's what's happening with religion now. You see, it has a few revivals, but always at a lower level. So these, these funny, irrational, fanatical beliefs are gradually giving way. And so for Hinduism, that is not really a problem. Hinduism is just a landscape, you see, and if certain beliefs are found to be wanting, then try something else. Whereas in Christianity or Islam, you are bound, you know, to buy the doctrine that's official, that's never going to change. But so in a, in a normal, free uh, religious landscape, as Hinduism has always been, uh, things can evolve. And so 
Ira- beliefs found to be irrational can be said, and all the rest remains valid. Whereas in Christianity, unfortunately, I mean, I've seen it myself, very many people who left Christianity left everything associated with it, like ethics. You know, you shouldn't steal, you shouldn't lie, and so on. You know, some people thought, well, now that I don't believe in in Jesus anymore, I don't believe in all these ethical principles anymore. Um, So that's a mistake. You know, ethics remains valid even if God isn't there or Jesus isn't there. Um, So, you see, that's one of the human problems that we now have to deal with at the end of the religions. Now that Christianity and Islam are disappearing, we have all these people on our hands, you see. So how do we guide them to a meaningful ethical life unencumbered by the superstitions that used to be the center of these people's lives? When you look at the psychology of Jesus and so on, you find that his focus is entirely on Jewish society. Yes. It does not extend to the non-Jews. And there are incidents where, you know, that uh, uh, a Gentile lady says that, you know, cure my child. He says, no, I came only for the sheep of Israel and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. But something has happened uh, in among its propagators rather than Jesus himself, which has turned it into a world religion that seeks to actively influence other people. My point is that abnormal behavior or unconventional behavior may be there in all kinds of religious contexts. But what is it that gives uh, these prophetic monotheistic religions this zeal for uh, being busy with other people, as Sitaram Goel put it? Hmm. Uh, has any psychological study been made on that? Hmm. Well, okay, let's start at the beginning. You see, the first... Um, Missionary religion was Buddhism. Why? You see, in, in the Hindu society that, you know, brought forth Buddhism, um, people just walked in their father's footsteps. You learn the uh, Vedic hymns, you learn to recite them, then you learn to read them and interpret them and so on in the lap of your father. And so, you see, everywhere, fathers teach their children whatever they know. A carpenter will learn his song carpentry. And so a Vedic reciter will learn his children Vedic reciting. And so they didn't need to go to the street corners and say, hey, come here, you know, I'm going to teach you. No, no, you see, (laughs) this happened naturally within the family. And yes, you see, once in a while, if a kid showed some interest, then, you know, somebody else's father would say, okay, you come to me, I'll teach you. But this all happened organically, naturally. Whereas in Buddhism, you didn't have children. You see, the Buddhist monks did not have children. So the only way for the monastic order to procreate is to get new recruits. So they had to go and propagate their thing, right? Now, yet, you see, Buddhism did not have the the basic funny beliefs of Christianity and Islam. Um, It is true, however, and this this is a a whole different subject we can talk about, you know, that subject also some other time, is the influence of Buddhism on Christianity. Because, you see, inside Christianity's teachings, some have been taken over wholesale from Buddhism. And so given that Buddhism had sent out preachers everywhere, some of them very successful, like in China, some of them not so successful, like in West Asia, but nevertheless not without leaving a certain influence. And so within the gospel, you have certain lines that are taken verbatim from Buddhism, right? Now, this idea of proselytization uh, may also owe something to that influence. Anyway, that's not the only thing, of course. 
and not even the main one, but historically it, it may have played a crucial role. No, you see, what is important in Christianity is the idea that um, a lot depends on your belief. You see, if you don't believe in Jesus, you're supposed to not find salvation. And so, since they love their fellow men, they are ordered to, they want the best for all of us. And so, they have to uh, convert us. Because they don't want us to go to hell, do they? You know, I get this question all the time from Hindus. Oh, but why do these missionaries want to convert us? Well, because they love you. You see, some Hindu polemicists say, oh, it's colonialism, it's racism, and so on. No, that's not true. <laughs> you see, in the Middle East, um, the first Christians tried to convert the people around them who were of the same color, the same language, and so on, the same background. Uh, race had nothing to do with it. They were underlings. The Jews were under the Romans. The Greeks were under the Romans and so on. It had nothing to do with empire, with colonialism. No, you see, they wanted to just spread the fire of the faith because a lot depended on it. Your salvation, your eternal life depended on it. So, you see, if, if you want to convert people for selfish reasons, well, that's not a very strong motive. That's not going to hold up for very long. But if you think you're doing something good, you know, you're, you're doing them a favor by trying to convert them. Now, that's a very strong motive. And proof is the success that Christianity has had. So, I mean, that's the, that's the, that's the, that's the official reason for Christians. Then, of course, add to that more pedestrian human reasons like you know you have to fulfill your quota it's like a salesman you see to, he has to justify the figures that he will present to his company at the end of the year or oh, i sold so many cars or what uh, so you have a personal interest in in giving uh, good figures okay so that also plays you see um then there is the competition you see, in India, the Baptist missionaries versus the evangelical missionaries versus the Catholic missionaries, they are also in competition among each other. That also eggs them on to do better in, in the game of uh, conversions. But so those are extra factors. The main factor is this concern, you see. I need to bring you salvation, otherwise you'll go to hell. So... The other question is that when you do this kind of historicizing reading and you're looking for material causes for events and so on, uh, the criticism comes from the religious believers that, in fact, these stories are meant to be taken in an allegorical and philosophical manner and uh, that you are always going for the most literal interpretation and then trying to extract all these, uh, you know, psychological syndromes and so on and so forth. So... So rather than interpreting it in a psychological manner, you should interpret it in a uh, philosophical manner and so on. So uh, this is metaphor and uh, the fall of mankind for, stands for something philosophical and so on and so forth. What is your answer to that kind of criticism from Christian Yes. Christ? Well, let me first start by um, quoting, quoting Ramakrishna. Um, you yourself have drawn my attention to um, a scene from the Mahabharata where this girl, um, I think Satyavati is her name, um, was nicknamed uh, Matsya Gandha, uh, having a fish smell, uh, which is a known, uh, a known syndrome. Where some girls um, do have a fish odor about themselves, and then certain hormonal changes, especially those triggered by pregnancy, 
will cure this syndrome. Now, what happens with Satyavati? She goes to bed with uh, Parashara and she gets pregnant and then she loses the fish smell. So she's very grateful to Parashara. She thinks, oh, you see this great sage, there is something miraculous about him because he cured me of this. Well, whatever the interpretation, whatever consequences are hung upon it, um, it's the description of a really existing single. And so we know that Satyavati, under whatever name, has really existed. Because, you see, in those days, they didn't have the kind of pathological knowledge to know about it, to know about this particular syndrome. If they describe that syndrome, it is because they really saw it, because there was a real person displaying this syndrome. Now, you see, this is what you have in the whole uh, diagnosis of prophets. You, you see a Jesus displaying typical psychopathological symptoms. Now, we don't know how exact, how complete the biblical narrative is. We shouldn't be too ambitious in pinning down this syndrome. But nevertheless, we get a number of symptoms that are just too strange to be invented. You see, they're realistic. They follow from a description of something that people really saw. Um, so the psychopathological approach to prophecy, tried by a number of psychologists in the 20th century, is really fruitful, you see. Uh, it has results. You know, you, you find very realistic, very credible uh, results. You know, you can really see that certain uh, prophetic phenomena are part of the landscape of human psychopathology. Like, for instance, like, for instance, that Jesus, you know, upon being baptized, he hears these voices. You see, there's two things here. There's a, a psychopathological syndrome, you know, something typical for people who hear voices is that the, the voices are in the second person. You, you are the spokesman of God. You are the incarnation of God. And so, so this is what you see here. Then you see a, a mass psychological as well as literary phenomenon, namely that which is first a completely subjective impression of the single person Jesus becomes more and more public. And at the end, it's given as an objective fact that everybody is witness to. You see, that's how these things develop in mass psychology. And so both these things, you see, this individual psychopathology and then the phenomenon of mass psychology as often witnessed in literature, um, these two come together and then are hopefully capably uh, applied by scholars. And so this way, you see, our knowledge of the fairly primitive phenomenon of, of prophetism is becoming more sophisticated, more precise. And so we are no longer enthralled by the impression that you get like that, you know, more primitive people got when they heard people asserting, oh, I'm hearing God, I'm hearing a voice and so on. When initially, when you don't know of anything and your neighbor suddenly comes to you and says, <laughs> I'm hearing the voice of God, you know, that's, that's rather impressive. But you see, now with our knowledge of psychology, we are not so impressed anymore. And so you see, this is, this is one of the phenomena that happens in people and it is only what it is. It's not God speaking. Yeah, thank you. And I might add a comment to what you said uh, just just now. Yeah. So you said that if your neighbor comes and says that I am hearing the voice of God, you you find it really strange. And uh, I might point out that Jesus himself says that a prophet is not honored in his own country. This is probably <laughs> an acknowledgement of this fact. <laughs> exactly. No, no, that's a very important point. You see, people around him knew him. And they knew his um, 
his strange habits and so on. And in fact, probably they joked amongst themselves about it. Oh, yeah, there he is again. Yeah, that's his typical thing. And <laughs> so there he didn't impress people. It's when he went out in new surroundings that people, you know, they saw him for the first time and then they were overall. It's also said that in some places he wasn't able to perform miracles. Because there you see people just saw through it. So yeah, that's, uh, I mean, here again, you have perfectly human psychology. That you see when you, when you are the, the, the tall, dark stranger coming from the next village, in those days, the next village was already far away. Uh, then you impress people. But when you are among your own people who have seen you grow up, who know, know everything about you, well, that's harder to impress. My question to you is, that you have some ideas how how this thing can be expedited. That uh, actually, to me, it is very simple. It is really telling the truth. And uh, so that means that if we look at, and all these uh, civilizations and re uh, religions, they grew out of watching nature. It is very, very clear to me. But then, you know, I, I, I can't write, I cannot communicate, I, I really don't know how to communicate either. So, uh, I, I, my question to you is that you have some ideas uh, regarding this, how this can be expedited? In, uh, in Europe, it went through a great acceleration in the 60s, 70s, 80s, um, mainly as a consequence of the democratization of education. You see, after the war, everybody started going to school. And so you become a bit more skeptical by more education. Mind you, education does not automatically produce results. Remember Osama bin Laden, who was an engineer. And in fact, even among, among Christian creationists, also they boast of many doctors and engineers and so on among their stalwarts uh, in, in critical sciences. I mean, they teach you critical thinking, critical interpretation of texts and of, of historical data in history and philology. Uh, there you won't find any religious fundamentalists. Because there you learn to critically evaluate the data. Whereas in the exact sciences, you know, you have very many people who in the daytime do exact science, do exact, you know, engineering or so. And then they come home and, you know, they, they, they take off their clothes of engineer and they put on other clothes and then they start seeing everything through a religious lens. Hmm? So, you know, just having a degree, that doesn't entirely help. Although it does help to some extent, um, simply because you develop a habit of analyzing things, of not taking things for granted. Uh, so it does, does encourage skepticism. But so the humanities do that even more. And um, so spreading that, that kind of knowledge, that makes people more critical of his religion. Now, there's also another factor. It is uh, materialism. You just distract people. Keep them busy with silly, you know, things, uh, movies, uh, TV, and so on. That is what is happening now in India with the Hindu youth. You see, they don't get any religious education in school. They get it less and less in the family because, you know, nowadays that both their parents are busy. Their grandparents aren't living in the same house anymore. The, the, you know, the great families is falling apart and so on. So they're more exposed to materialism, they're more exposed to consumerism, they're more exposed to silly distractions. And so they have less of religion and it's, they are less serious about life. Um, so that's in a way what you should not have, but on the other hand, you know, you should take inspiration from that. You know, <laughs> it is quite possible to change people's minds gradually. 
But you see, I prefer to give people real education, uh, to give them real values, and then also they will start doubting certain things that aren't uh, sustainable. Like I gave the example of geocentrism and heliocentrism. Once you know about heliocentrism, you can't possibly go back to geocentrism. No amount of propaganda is going to make you do that. Um, so, so I am all for uh, proper education. And yes, you see, education also has a religious part, but not a doctrinal part. Um, you see, these, these doctrines really are outdated. That you, you really can't go back to them once you've analyzed them. But, you know, religion in a broader sense, uh, that does remain relevant. I mean, religion in the sense of consciousness cultivation, that remains entirely relevant. And so right now we are going through a somewhat difficult phase. Uh, we still have to deal with the the uh the, the islam problem and so on but i am fairly sure that in a hundred or so years um good sense will have will have conquered the whole scene will have conquered humanity and yoga practices will be prevailing and these uh, superstitious doctrines will be a memory I mean, we're going there. You know, if you compare the world today with the world 300 years ago, you do see the trend. You do see where it's going. And so in spite of the fact that you still have to go through a certain crises, okay, you know, it's, it, it doesn't go automatically. It doesn't come easily. But nevertheless, we are heading the right way. In, in a very fundamental sense, I'm optimistic. I mean, of course, we still have to go through a number of difficult uh, experiences, but nevertheless, we're going the right way. Uh, Dr. Elster, I just wanted your opinion on uh, uh, two points of view. One by Richard Dawkins, who calls this idea of God itself a delusion, and mm. uh, about, about Arun Shauri, who has written Two Saints, Yes, you know, where also, again, he explores psychology and neurological phenomena. So what is your opinion on these two uh, people and how they approach the issue? Yes. Yeah, the book Two Saints I've reviewed even before I had read it. The only book ever that I'd reviewed before reading it. Um, so, you know, this whole idea is, uh, is quite simple. You know, the Ramakrishna uh, Paramahansa and uh, Ramana Maharshi both had a great following. And in both cases, some of the followers claimed that the, 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 the guru had certain visions, was a visionary. Like about Ramakrishna, it is said that, you know, he had a vision of Jesus and a vision of Muhammad and so on. This is all invented, but anyway, that's what being said about them. So the question can then be asked, especially by a, a modern educated man like Arun Shauri, um, what, what is true of this? You see, what should we believe of this? And I think, you see, if you reduce spirituality to having visions, you know, to visualizing certain ideas, well, then you see there's not much to it. And, you know, if you see Ramakrishna and uh, Ramana in that light, well, then you can deconstruct them because, you know, these visions are not where it's at. And if you read the Yoga Sutra or something, you will see that that's not about visions. It's about the, the, the self resting in the self, you know, the seer, the consciousness resting inside itself rather than being constantly busy with other things. You see the, uh, the five, um, 
vrittis, the, the five types of movements of the mind, are, and they are worth enumerating, they are sleep, uh, true knowledge, false knowledge, um, imagination, and memory. And so, if you find yourself in a certain state of mind, it is always one of these five. Um, now, what is a vision? You see, a vision is a sort of imagination. Is one of those five. What is yoga? Is conquering these five. Yoga is a state that is a state of consciousness that is none of these five. So also not imagination. Or if you take your imagination too seriously, if you think it's real, if you believe in a marriage, then it becomes false knowledge. But false knowledge is also one of the five hindrances, one of the five states of consciousness that you have to overcome. So yoga is a state of emptiness. And uh, so different from all these visions and so on. So uh, from the tradition itself, from the Yoga Sutra at any rate, you can deduce that if these saints are associated with visions, well, then they're not to be taken very seriously, right? Uh, or they are wrongly associated with those visions. You know, visions are ten of ten, okay? Whereas the yogic state, now that's special, that's worth pursuing. And in fact, those two saints are important because of their yoga practice, not because of their supposed visions. Um, then you mentioned Richard Dawkins. Now, um, I have a few of his books here, but I haven't read them yet, but I've read many of his interviews and so on. And so I vaguely know what he's about. So he's really against um, religion itself. And so if you asked him, probably he would include Hinduism along with Christianity and Islam. Um, because he probably, like most Westerners and like very many Indians, doesn't really understand how radical the yoga philosophy is. And so it's quite different from the beliefs, from the assumptions that are central to Christianity or Islam. Um, a, a, a character very similar to Dawkins, namely uh, Daniel Dennett, I've personally seen in the university here when he came to speak. And so... He spoke rather disparagingly about, you know, the stuff that religious people do. I asked him, well, what about meditation? And to my surprise, he knew about meditation very well. In fact, he practiced it every day. Not perhaps a very sophisticated meditation, but the stuff that uh, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi taught. Uh, so-called transcendental meditation, which means saying a mantra. And um, so he did that every day. But, he said, and I quote, I don't give any metaphysical meaning to it. It's just good against my high blood pressure. Right? <laughs> so, so that's a... Uh, a sort of skeptical or down to earth way of looking at looking at meditation, uh, but so he didn't dismiss it out of hand. I mean, he already gave it more value, gave it a very practical value, as against the beliefs that we find Christianity or Islam. Um, so, you see, I think that to the extent that those skeptics. Uh, know about uh, the unique things that Hindu Dharma has to offer, they will more and more make a difference between these really valuable um, contributions of yoga that really have a future uh, as against the irrational beliefs that define a number of religions. Yeah, that pretty much answers my question. Yeah.
and uh, the follow up is at the other end of the spectrum there are theologians like uh, bultmann yeah who say that none of this needs to be true but we have christ of myth yeah and that is something for us so what yeah. is the position on that what is the what are the developments on that front yes well there is a difference between christianity and christians you see in 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 real christianity in orthodox christianity the christianity of the dogmas nothing has changed so <laughs> You see, it is still as Saint Paul said that you see the faith, the faith is is empty, is meaningless if there was no resurrection. You see, they take this resurrection quite literally. There's nothing of myth or you know the the Christ of faith or so. That's all wishy washy. You know, that's that's you know uh, having your cake and eating it too. um no you see <laughs> either you believe in this strange idea of the resurrection or you don't but then you're not a christian anymore um so i know that in the 20th century especially you had these people who had a problem with faith who saw that faith was contradictory with the the, the achievements of the modern world and so that's one of the ways to uh to to reconcile the two say that yeah you see uh, i know that it, it it can't really be defended rationally but it's a myth well yeah you know you can invent all kinds of myths that's true um but that's not christianity anymore you see christianity means as jesus said you see nobody comes to the father except through me that's what jesus said at least according to the gospel because of course the gospel has also been written down by some people so they already may have had certain doctrines that then found their way into scripture uh, at any rate thus far you see that is what christianity has always thought that there really was a resurrection now if you say oh it's only a myth Well, I'd say that then you're not really a Christian anymore. Now here Christians are going to violently protest. I mean, I've seen them do it. Um are going to say, uh, we don't want non-Christians to tell us what real Christianity is." But, you know, there there is something objective about this. This is the Christian faith. The Christians themselves have laid it down. The Nicene Creed You see that defines Christianity. Now, uh, if you don't believe in that, well, then just leave the church. You know, you can always do. That's what I have done. Uh, whereas you see this, 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 this in between situation. Okay, you see the dogmas are outdated. I don't believe them anymore, but I am still a Christian. Now. Yeah, well, I guess you know we we have to let that generation die out. um i mean it seems that they're quite attached to their uh, to their beliefs uh but i mean it's it's not sustainable it's not sustainable you know as a non christian you can say what christians must believe namely if they want to remain christians of course they can believe anything they want i'm not going to tell them what to believe but i simply apply a definition you know if you If you think it's all a myth and so on, yeah, you, you can believe that, but then it's no longer Christianity. Then the other part is about again historicization. This time from the Hindu side, which is that if you start historicizing all the epics again, just like you are historicizing the Bible, then it is bound to uh, not lead to anything fruitful. Which is, I think, the line of argument that people like Vishwad Luri are adopting and saying that just don't look for any kind of historical information in the veda or the dasharagi war or anything like that just take mm-hmm. it as it so what does that do for uh, hindus just as this does something for christians yeah. what would that do for hindus well you see history simply means reality you know what really happened what really happened to make the people write down or or compose 
the text of the Veda, you see, it's not something that just fell from the sky. I mean, that's what traditionalists say. Oh, yeah, it was God-given and ever since creation and so on. Well, sorry, that's not what happened. You know, if you really read the Vedas, you can see that they're a human creation. Like, they are situated in time and space. I mean, any human writing, you don't have to write about history, you know. You write poetry. Okay, what do I see in your poetry? It doesn't mention cars, right? It doesn't mention living in caves. Hmm? It doesn't mention giraffes and other African animals. It doesn't mention polar bears and other Siberian animals. Okay? But it does mention uh, tigers and so on. It does mention elephants. It's Indian. And so if you study the Veda, you can see it's from Northwest India and it's from the Bronze Age. There are no cavemen in there. There are no automobiles in there. It's not ancient. It's not modern. It's in between. It's from the Bronze Age. And so now that's history. You see, they don't have to describe historical events, although they do even that, like the Battle of the Ten Kings. So there are a number of historical events. Or they give genealogical details. They say, oh, this was my grandfather, and this is my wife, and she's the daughter of this one, and so on and so on. So all kinds of human data are in there. So of course it's a human product. And that doesn't even require any proof. I mean, I know there are many Twitter trolls who challenge me, ah, prove it that it's historical. No, you see, you go prove that it's not historical. I mean, if I say, you know, I, I go to the bookshop, I, I take a book. I say, okay, this was written by someone. Maybe his name is not on the cover. Or maybe it's a pseudonym or whatever. But I'm very sure it has been written by someone. And so if you want to say, no, it was not written by someone. It was thrown down from heaven. Well, that's something you can prove. You know, if, if you think proof is of the order of the day, well, you go prove that. And so, of course, <laughs> it's just automatic that this is the product of history. You know, something happened, and the result is that we have this book. And so that happens with the Bible, too. All kinds of historical things have happened. And so they were not always understood by the people. Like Moses looked at a natural phenomenon of the ethereal oil from a plant in the desert catching fire under the rays of the afternoon sun. That's a totally natural phenomenon that the fairly primitive person Moses didn't fully understand. And so he gave some religious higher meaning to it. Okay. But so something historical happened. And so certain insights that have become the core of religions, you know, are a bit deplorable, are a bit outdated, are a bit primitive. Others are not. You see, what Patanjali writes about the human mind, about the process of meditation, that's ex extremely important, extremely valid, is not outdated at all. And so, you know, you have to have some, some tolerance for human weakness. Okay. It's no big deal that people have believed in these funny beliefs of Christianity or Islam. It's no big deal. But now you see we're advanced enough to outgrow these beliefs. You know, it's, 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 it's been enough now. Yeah. Yet another question this time on uh, history. So, uh, you said that there is this connection between Akhenaten and Moses. And I do know yeah. that, uh, you know, some of the Psalms have been said to be very close to the hymns to the sun that uh, yeah. Akhenaten had composed. Uh, mm -hmm. What uh, have we found more connections between them? Because one thing that seems very different for me is that if Moses as an Egyptian was taking or reviving the idea of Akhenaten, he would have naturally gravitated towards his sun god mm -hmm. rather than taking this Bedouin god, especially when he himself was an Egyptian. Yeah. So uh, what do we know about the more organic connections between uh, Egypt, Akhenaten and Moses? 
as a yeah player. well the word no is a, a tall order i'm afraid that you know we have good reasons to assume certain connections but um our knowledge there is not complete and you know this happens in in history if you do historical studies you know you, you, there are gaps in your knowledge and so sometimes these gaps may very suddenly be filled up. You know, it just takes one discovery. Then you have to watch out, of course, that there are not false discoveries. Like, you know, you have many, you know, false so-called discoveries about Jesus, about, like, I recently read something about a Bible text, um, uh, or an apocryphal gospel in which there is no resurrection where Jesus isn't really dead, which is what Muslims have been saying all along. So, I mean, maybe there maybe there were such beliefs, but they're not so very important. We do have the church teaching um, that there was a resurrection, and that's what Christianity is based on. Now, I don't believe in a resurrection. So whether it's being written down in the Bible or not, at any rate, it didn't happen. <laughs> Uh, but so, so I mean, yeah, there there are all kinds of beliefs, but you know, we just have to use our critical mind and see what is possible, uh, see what is supported by historical data, and so we can perfectly live without the belief that the Quran was directly revealed to Muhammad. We can live without the belief that the Ten Commandments were given by Yahweh to Moses. We can live without the belief that Jesus came to deliver us from sin by his death and resurrection. Um, so I propose that we do away with these childish beliefs and then quite a few things remain. You see, stuff that has traditionally been part of the religious sphere uh, remain valid. You see, the whole culture of consciousness, of course, also the whole uh, system of ethics, dharma to a large extent means ethics, that remains valid. You see, the way you relate to other beings, not just human beings, all the beings in the cosmos, uh, the way you relate to the whole of the cosmos, that might more be the meaning of religion. Uh, you see, those things remain valid, but superstitious beliefs don't remain valid. You can outgrow them. Um, so I, I cannot but hammer on that, you know. Let's, let's do that. In fact, I think for most of us, this is already a done thing. Um, but so I think that is the way forward. It was specifically about uh, Dr. Vishwa Adluri's arguments against historicizing. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. Ex yes, of course. You see, I mean, uh, <laughs> I mean, I've, I've had interesting conversations with uh, Dr. Adluri and great respect for his scholarship. Nevertheless, that is an idea that <laughs> we don't see eye to eye on. Um, I remember him saying, uh, you know, asking about the, the history behind the Mahabharata is a perverse question. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, you see, that's an entirely valid question. And so, um, you know, something really happened that gave rise to the Mahabharata story. So there was a real war that really took place by a number of kings that exist in the genealogies that have been preserved in, in Hindu scripture. And they fought a real war. Then whether the epic is all reality, now that's a different question. You see, it has been embellished a whole lot and all kinds of little stories have been shoved into it, interpolated and so on. From the real history, to the to the, the literature of the Mahabharata, that's a long way. But yes, of course, there was a, a, a real history to start with. This war really took place. Now, whether it was a Krishna giving a sermon of the Gita at the beginning of the battle and so on, 
that may all have been inserted later, or, or, or in this case, it may not be. I mean, these are things we can research, but uh, the, the, the basic fact remains that there is a war that really happened. And so we can give historical details about that war or, or try to find them, like when did it happen? Where did it happen? That's fairly certain. Kurukshetra is well known. And at the site of Kurukshetra, that whole battlefield is demarcated. So, um, and you could, in principle, do the, the same thing for other wars in Indian history, like the Battle of the Ten Kings happened on the banks of the Ravi River, which is today the border between India and Pakistan. You know, the Battle of the Ten Kings was the first Indo-Pak war, so to speak, 5,000 years ago. Um, and, and so, you know, a number of historical data about this are known. And, you know, you can't get away from that anymore. We know them now. Like, for instance, you know that the the Mahabharata war was a chariot war. You know, it was a battle between chariots where the role of Krishna, very central in the story, is as a chariot war. Right? So you know when it happened. Because chariot warfare is a specific window in history. First, there were no chariots at all. Well, then there were carts, oaks drawn and slow and so on. Then they were perfectioned, uh, perfected to become um, war chariots. Then they were used uh, in about 1500 BC. They were used by the Hittites. They were used by the pharaohs. Um, and they were used in India. And then came cavalry. When you had the stirrup, you could sit stable on a horse. And you could draw the bow while sitting on a horse, while riding, and so on. So then that became more efficient than using chariots. Um, so then chariots became a thing for spectator sports in the Roman arena. Uh, but so as a, as a means of warfare, it was outdated. So you have a very specific window in history between about, you know, maybe 1700 and 700 BC, that this is the, the, the best means of warfare. So that's when the battle must have taken place. I think about 1500 BC, but again, you see, that's a discussion. But at any rate, it couldn't happen in the Stone Age. And so, yeah, it's, it's history. And so, you know, you can use all the historical methods to, to find out more and more and more about it. You know, the archaeology of the battle and so on, that will also make our knowledge more precise. But of course, it's history. And then, on top of that history, you see, literature has been produced and evolved and new things have been added and so on, and reinterpretation and but all these perfectly normal human processes studied in this case by uh, philology uh, are are there. And there's nothing supernatural about it. And it's also not uniquely Indian. You see, this is something quite in common with uh, Homer in Greece, with the Iliad and the uh, Odyssey. Uh, so it's, it's not even typically Indian. Yeah. So, I have yet another question, if you don't mind. No, I don't mind at all. Okay, so this is about uh, uh, the permeation of yoga in the Western world. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I'm not sure I share your optimism that much, because I have also seen so many testimonies of Christians who seem to have sincerely undertaken yoga, and it uh, seems to have adverse effects on them. Really? And so, they double down and go back to Christianity with even greater faith, saying that, ah, yes, now what Christianity said about uh, demonic possession and opening yourself to satanic powers is actually right. So, uh, what is the reason behind this phenomenon? Well, first let me point out that within Hinduism, there have also been debates about yoga. One I studied somewhat is uh, between Guru Nanak and the Nath Yogis. 
And so Guru Nanak stands for Bhakti. And in Bhakti, you rely on the deity. As you do in Christianity, you know, where you, you're not capable of saving yourself, you have to, you know, attach yourself to Jesus and he's going to save you. Um, whereas the Nath yogis, they do yoga and they count on yoga to do it for them. So in yoga, you do it yourself. Right now, within Hinduism, that is already a source of tension. You know, there, there are two different opinions about this. Or something else in, 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 um, in, in Hinduism, I think it's from Shaiva Siddhanta. Uh, the, the, the contrast between the way of the kitten and the way of the baby monkey. You know, the idea that uh, you know, one approach is that you yourself are desirous of uh, liberation. You sit out on the path yourself. And the other view is, no, you see, only the deity can do that. The deity takes you up. And so uh, the way that the cat, you know, takes the kitten into her mouth, rather than waiting, you know, the baby monkey who grabs uh, his mother. Um, so, you know, you, you have these different views within Hinduism. You have them also within Christianity. Sometimes they are also between Hinduism and Christianity. Um, but so, uh, in the case of modern Christians doing yoga, uh, you, I mean, I've heard different reports. So one school says that, uh, yoga is intrinsically unchristian. Because again, you count on something else than Jesus, whether it is really yourself or it is ghosts that take possession of you. That's then yet another point of disagreement. But at any rate, it's not Jesus. Whereas it's only Jesus who can save. So, but then you have, you have Christian yoga also, you know, and Christians who are quite, uh, quite sure about yoga, but for them, yoga is just like, physical exercise even if it also includes breath exercise and and mental exercise nevertheless it is not your soul that is involved and so it's like it's like you do fitness you do ballet you do martial arts whatever you know i mean all these things are useful from a christian viewpoint they're not forbidden only they don't bring you salvation and so similarly yoga may be useful or relaxation or better concentration or what, but it doesn't give you salvation. But that's, that's the proper Christian view. Um, then there are people who don't believe in salvation. That's another section of the Western audience, an ever larger section, I would say, who simply do yoga for the benefits. And so for a large number, this is only physical benefits. Then more and more people are aware of a deeper dimension, but still it's not something ultimate. It's just benefits. You remain you. Um, so what I see is that, um, among the very many who do yoga nowadays, and here I mean really many, I mean, that number keeps growing, uh, more and more people are graduating are moving up, are seeing the philosophical dimension and, you know, are studying this. Like you see what is now all the rage in the West is Kashmiri Shaivism. And so many people study this and they know about it, 36 tatwas and, you know, whatever. And so more and more people are getting more sophisticated about it. They are also less hampered by the Christian heritage because that, that, doesn't exist for the new generation anymore. And so, apart from the fact that the whole TV culture and so on makes people more superficial, less profound, nevertheless, the number of people who go into the profundities uh, behind yoga is growing. And so, yeah, you see, it all goes too slow and so on, I agree with you, but nevertheless, it's going in the right direction. No, no, personally, I'm quite optimistic about that.
My question is on something uh, at several times. Uh, intuition was really referred to as at one place uh, uh, you had mentioned about uh, uh, neighbor saying that it occurred to me and things like that. My, okay, my direct question is that what do you think about intuition? Is it, uh, is, uh, uh, is it, is it scientific in, in, in your opinion? Yeah, that, that's a word that, that I'm, um, I'm a bit helpless with. You see, I don't understand what intuition really is. Uh, um, I mean, you see, people think that there is some direct, direct way of knowledge that bypasses rath- ratiocination, um, that bypasses rational thinking. And I don't see that. I mean, I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, I know that sometimes, uh, like mothers suddenly feel that something is wrong with their child. They run to the child and they see indeed that it needed its mother right at that moment. Um, so yeah, I mean, those ways of knowledge may be there. Um, but they are like an extra sense. And so, you know, if there's six senses instead of five, well, yeah, but that, that doesn't alter the fundamental structure of consciousness that you have pure consciousness. And then that is surrounded by a number of tentacles, five or maybe more than five. But essentially, there are just a number of tentacles that are not consciousness itself. Um, so I don't think that that fundamentally alters our map of human consciousness. My question to you, Dr. Els, is that uh, when uh, Judas, um, you know, he stopped believing in Christ as the mm. Messiah and he wanted to get hand him over. So what is the psychology of uh, of Judas? I mean, does, is he the one who is rational and he sees through it and he is uh, doing it for a better thing or something? I know what is said in the Bible. But what exactly do you have a psychology of the people who kill the prophets? Like the, who, I mean, why I killed the Mahatma? So what is Judas' psychology? Of course, we only have the version of the gospel. So we don't know exactly what really happened. Actually, here you have a good question, because this is something I've never thought about. Why does Judas do what he does? You see, he gets paid, of course, 30 pieces of silver, but that's because his anger is thinking that that is going to make him happy, that that's why he does it. But it's not certain that that's why he does it. He does not, not necessarily do it for money. Yeah, well. But I don't think that the Bible intimates any other reason why he does it. So... No, I, okay. I have to, I have to study that question. It's interesting. Um, you know, what has been done with it in the history of Christianity, that's of course something else. I mean, the name Judas, of course, refers to Judah, one of the 12 sons of Israel, uh, after whom the Jews are named Jewish people. You know, Judaism. And so, Christians have often associated Judas with the crowd of Jewish people who claim her for Jesus' blood. And so that has played a nasty role in anti-Semitism. Modern Christians are certainly going to say, "Uh, yeah, but that's not really what what Judas solely refers to. But at any rate, Christians have long interpreted that way um but so that's not i mean let's go along with the christian apologists who say oh no 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 it, it, it just does not refer to the judaic people well maybe not 
But you see, then I, I, I don't have the real answer, except, you know, the superficial one that he does it for the 30 pieces of silver. Now it's, it's interesting. There is a novel that I used to read long ago. You see, when I was a teenager, um, my parents had the whole collection of, uh, pantheon of the Nobel Prize winners. So every Nobel Prize winner of literature had a big volume with several of his books and essays together. And so I read many of them. Um, and so there was one by Peer Lagerkrist. I think he's Danish or Norwegian. And so he has a book about Judas. And so explaining the psychology of Judas or giving at least his, his view of it. But you see, that's like 45 years ago since I read that. So I, I don't know much about it anymore. At any rate, you see, that's, that's only what he fills in as Judas's motives. Um, Judas ends up repenting at any rate in, in that, that version. Yeah. Well. I think, Dr. Elst, you should bring out the book, Why I Killed the Christ. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's an interesting topic. Okay. Well, one uh, interesting contrast between the yogic tradition and the prophetic tradition that strikes me is that in every yogic tradition, you usually have some kind of disciplic initiation and succession. Whereas the prophetic monotheistic tradition specifically says that the Lord raises prophets. So the job of getting the next prophet is not given to the prophet himself. Mm. So is this something unique to Judaism or is it something that was there in the ambient uh, Middle Eastern culture among the Assyrians and so on? You see, prophets were some kind of an institution. You know, I mean, there were families of prophets where, where you see, the son learned the trade of being a prophet. Um, you do have you do have uh, families of soothsayers in other cultures who learn to predict the future. So it's something similar to that. You see, to some extent, profit was an honorable profession. And so the really spectacular cases of prophecy are people who do not exactly uh, walk in those footsteps. Like, for instance, the... Um, the head priest in Jerusalem, um, he, he was to carry in his breastplate the Urim and Tumim. Now we don't know exactly what the Urim and Tumim were, but they were devices used for fortune telling. And they were something like, um, like yin and yang, like the two sides of a coin used in consulting the Book of Changes. And so there's like a toss of a coin. You see, you speak up with myself, okay, shall I go left or right? Okay, you see, if I get the head side, then I go left. If I get the number side, then I go right. So it's a very simple system of consulting the spirits up there. Right? So... So, you see, prophecy to some extent was a profession. But you see that the, the really interesting cases of prophecy were, are where they go outside these trodden paths, you know, where they suddenly have something happen that then becomes a large and influential prophecy, like the burning bush. So there was no procedure about a burning bush. The Egyptians didn't know about the burning bush. And the Bedouins, they knew about the burning bush. And precisely for that reason, they didn't attach any, you know, mystical meaning to it. But when you get the combination of some cultivated but ignorant Egyptian seeing the Bedouin, you know, environment with the burning bush, then suddenly something happens. Um, so the two things exist, you see, the prophecy is something exceptional and it's mostly the, the more influential and the more interesting stuff. 
But then you have prophecy as a routine, as a professional practice. And so there you mainly get prophecy in the, in the sense of predicting the future. Like, uh, the word is used in the gospel once where, uh, Jesus meets this woman. And so he, he tells her, you have already had five husbands. And then she says, Oh, I see you are a prophet. That is to say, I, I see you can, you can, you know, see through people. You can foretell the future. And so you know things that aren't obvious. Huh? Yeah, so that's also a sense of prophet. And so that's where prophet answers to uh, a certain routine of, uh, you know, predicting the future. And so these people who had a profession of predicting the future, you know, they lapse into uh, easy stuff to, to produce predictions. Like you have in the Oracle of Delphi, you know, the, the Oracle of Delphi starts to develop methods to say things that sound true, you know, to practice the art of formulating in such a way that what you say is always true. You know, that's what skeptics nowadays reproach astrologers and so on, you know, that they are going to predict something, but they do it in such a way that it's always true, that you can always explain yourself, that you never lose faith. Um, but so that's the, the sort of the, the ordinary form of prophecy. You see, the one that is most influential is something special. Um, you know, either because of the, you know, combination of unexpected circumstances like in the burning bush, or because it is just very artfully done. Like M Moses produces all kinds of sound and fury to make the Ten Commandments a really credible prophecy. Whereas he's of course hoodwinking the people. And in the, in the, in the Bible story itself, you find enough indications that he has all set, that he has set it all up. 